Let's take our Bibles uh, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. And, of course, we have so many this time of year traveling in and out and back and forth. And, and uh, we just encourage you to keep folks in prayer. We were talking at last night's prayer meeting about what an opportunity it is in these holiday seasons to witness to family and try to encourage them to know the Lord and live for Him. And I know many of you have loved ones that are unsaved and, and a great opportunity for you. And I pray for you that God will bless you with wisdom and the power of the Holy Spirit to be the witness you ought to be uh, to your family. And um, there are opportunities as well because of the holiday season to bring Christ into your conversations uh, even at work. And so I pray that God will bless you as you seek to do those things. Second uh, Corinthians chapter number 11, and we'll begin reading in verse 1. Second Corinthians 11 and 1. The Bible says, Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Father, we are grateful for your word this morning and uh, thankful for the opportunity that we have to be able to preach from the Bible. I pray that you'll bless the uh, Lord and help me to be a blessing to these gathered today. May the Holy Spirit guide our thoughts and words May the Lord Jesus Christ be glorified in it all. And I pray, uh, Lord, that you will help us as we look into your word uh, to consider the ways of our own life, especially, Lord, as believers. And uh, to, Lord, allow you to draw us close to you and help us, Lord, to walk in truth. Lord, we pray and ask these things this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to focus here this morning on that verse number three where Paul said, For I, excuse me, but I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Uh, if there's any time in the world when there is such great opportunity, as I mentioned a moment ago, to witness, it's now. But at the same time, if there is any time religiously that is complicated, complex, and confused, it's this time. Our world is becoming more and more complicated, more and more complex. I've Often, uh, when I think about it, I think about the uh, advances in technology. And I read somewhere, I, I don't remember where, but that uh, in the early uh, advances of the computers, uh, people were being told that because of the power of, uh, of these machines and efficiency of them, that mankind wouldn't have to work 12 hour days anymore. They'd just be working four hours a day and get all their work done. Uh, that might be true after they spend four hours trying to get the thing to work correctly. But, uh, <laughs> our world is indeed getting more and more complex and many, many lives are entangled in lies and ensnared in darkness and deception. And much of the complexity of life is, uh, comes about uh, of our own making. And uh, we mentioned recently, maybe on last Wednesday, about being careful to make choices to line our life up biblically to the best of our ability, uh, realizing that God has a plan for our life. God has a purpose for it. And the most important thing we can do is lock into that plan. Uh, 
Go, t- take your Bible and go back with me, please, to Mark chapter number four. Mark chapter four. We talk about this matter, uh, mentioned this matter of complexity and, uh, and uh, getting tangled up in things. And it brought several verses to mind. We'll look at those by way of introduction this morning. Mark chapter number four. And uh, he's talking here about uh, the sower, uh, the seed representing the word of God, the seed that is sown representing the word of God. In verse 14 of Mark, uh, Mark chapter 4, he says, The sower soweth the word. He talks about different uh, f- uh, levels of fruitfulness as a result of that sowing. And he says down here in verse 18, And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. So we see the end result here of being tangled up in unnecessary things is a loss in fruitfulness of our life. Uh, Spiritual fruit for the Lord. Look over at Galatians chapter number five. Galatians chapter number five and um, and verse one. Galatians five and one. And we see another reference here to being entangled. Galatians five and one. The Bible says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Now, he's talking here about being careful not to be drawn into the demands of the law. The Judaizers had tried to get the Christians to go back under the demands of the law, and it was stifling their Christianity. So he said, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So when we see this idea of entanglement, we see uh, previously, a a moment ago, we saw a a loss of fruit. Here we see a loss of freedom, a loss of freedom. When we allow ourselves to become entangled with unnecessary things. Uh, Look further at 2 uh, 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy in chapter number 2. 2 Timothy chapter number 2. He's talking here to Timothy. Paul is encouraging him to be faithful in his ministry to the Lord. Uh, And he says in in verse 3, 2 Timothy 2 and 3, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And so in this particular verse, we see that entanglement, unnecessary entanglement, uh, causes a loss of focus and therefore effectiveness for the Lord. And then over one more uh, in 2 Peter chapter 2, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 20. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 20. And here, of course, there is the rebuke against false teachers and seducers. Second Peter chapter two, verse 20 says, for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the uh, through the excuse me, if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Brother Anthony talked about uh, something toward that end in Sunday school this morning when he talked about how that he was saved and separated himself from those ungodly things and those un, uh, 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 unchristlike things of the world. And uh, we see here that last phrase, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. And of course, this would refer uh, to those who... Uh, have uh, drawn nigh to the Lord in some way, but then turn and go back. And the worst, the, the end is worse than the beginning. And all of it, in every case, that word entanglement or some form thereof is used. And uh, Satan is seeking to beguile and corrupt uh, our lives through his subtlety. His first work, of course, is to keep people from believing on Jesus Christ. And uh, he does not want people to be saved. 
And so he uses many different uh, tactics to confuse people's minds, to complicate the gospel, to complicate the Bible so that people uh, end up uh, refusing for one reason or another to be born again. He blinds the minds of unbelievers. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 3, the Bible says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The devil is blinding people's eyes. And... Uh, uh, so that they will not see and, re and respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That blindness is all around us this morning. Somebody the other day had asked me, they said, uh, how, uh, how do you all uh, like this area? You know, and most time I'll get asked that question after the people hear me talk. And they recognize, well, <laughs> where are you from, you know, and... I said, the area is great. I love the history and the heritage of this area uh, and all. Uh, but I said this, uh, buddy, for many, it's a spiritual graveyard. Uh, there are lots of good conveniences, uh, lots of positive things. But the thing that challenges me about this area is that it's inundated with churches. They're everywhere. And the people, I'm talking about the unsaved, the unsaved people in this town have heard and seen about everything religiously they can hear and see. They've been inundated with it. It's on their television, comes in their mailbox, it's on their door. I mean, all the time. Uh, and the problem, the close problem to inundation is inoculation. People become numb to the truth that is right in their midst. They just get used to it being around them. And the devil uses that comfort with nearby truth to blind people in darkness. You know, there's a lot of people who say, well, I'm not against religion. But we don't talk about religion. We talk about a relationship with Jesus Christ. And there's a world of difference, of course, between those two things. We live in a, in a very confused world, but more pointedly, we live in a very confused community with regard to the truth of the gospel. Jesus said in Matthew 13, 19, when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. Well, that's a good picture of it right there. Catches away. Why? Because of the many distractions, because of the much busyness of life, because of the complexity of things around them. The devil just snatches the seed of the gospel away from the minds of those that need to be saved. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. And so the devil's first desire is to so complicate people's lives that they're blinded to the gospel. But if he should fail in that and someone should receive Christ as Savior, he then sets out to beguile and corrupt the minds of believers. In other words, he sets out to distract us and pull us away to unnecessary things. And the Bible tells us in our text in 2 Corinthians 11 that he does this through his subtlety. We learn very early on in the Bible that the devil is subtle. And he deceived Eve, the Bible says, because he was more subtle than any beast of the field. And he distracted her and led her into disobedience. That word subtlety uh, in our text means craftiness. It means duplicity. It has the idea of cunning, false wisdom. And when a believer is beguiled or deceived, 
uh, his or her heart becomes entangled in lies, ensnared in darkness and deception. And uh, uh, we end up uh, in a state of having been corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. The word translated simplicity means singleness. It means sincerity. It is the idea of the virtue of one who is free from pretense or hypocrisy. And that word is used in Acts chapter 2 and verse 46. They continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Simplicity means being clear or uncomplicated. Now, have you ever found yourself at the end of, day, end of the day just frazzled because of all of the chaos going on? Then have you maybe taken some time to think through how in the world did this happen? How did my life get so unfocused? How did I somehow or another slip from the singleness of heart that I knew maybe in the early days of my salvation? Look, Jesus Christ is not interested uh, in weighing us down with complicated and impossible demands. If there's anybody on the face of the planet that knew that we could not live up to him, it was him. He only gave us 10 commandments and we blew all of those. And so he, pre he, he presents us with a way of life. And that's what Christianity is. A way of life that is very simple in its terminology. Uh, look at, look uh, back at Mark again, if you would, please. Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter number 12 and verse uh, 29. And here it is. Mark 12 and 29. And Jesus answered him, well, he was asked a question for context, the last part of verse 28, which is the first commandment of all. Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. That's simplicity. That's far better than Hinduism. Uh, with its multiplicity of gods. Amen. There is one God. That makes it simple. Why? Because it's the way it is. Now, verse 30. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. Love God. Love God. With all your heart. Now, that entails a lot of different uh, other aspects of Christianity, doesn't it? But he says, love God. And that reminds me of uh, Revelation where the Lord said the, the, uh, the problem with the church at Ephesus was they had left their first love. What had happened in love for other things had crept in. And he says, verse 31, and the second is like, uh, is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. And uh, he said that on these two things hang all the law and the prophets. Simplicity. Uh, he makes salvation simple. He makes knowing him simple. He makes living the Christian life simple. Uh, he makes serving him very simple. In Jesus Christ, we find, uh, we find life to be clear and uncomplicated. Uh, and that's why it's so important that we keep our eyes on Him. 
If we allow our minds to become corrupted from or turned from the simplicity that is in Christ, there is no possible way for us to have peace in this world. Because without Jesus Christ and his, and his instruction to us, we, we will not rightly understand the mysteries of life. We will not be able to solve the problems of life. We will not have the power we need to successfully live this life. We need Jesus Christ. And we need the simplicity that is in Him. That brings us power and peace and wisdom. The songwriter said it this way, O soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior in life, more abundant and free. So do what? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And so in this complicated and complex and hypocritical and self-seeking, insincere, pretentious, dishonest, ungodly world, we need the simplicity of Jesus Christ to maintain our focus. Why is that? Well, several reasons. One, because he has uncomplicated answers for the basic questions of life. There are the questions of past, present, and future. How did we get here? Whole volumes of science libraries are written trying to answer that question. Whole library of books, I should say. Where did we come from? And uh, what are we to do here? And where are we going? Uh, and in his simplicity, God answers all of those questions. The Bible tells us in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word's Word was God uh, because the same was in the beginning with God. All things were created by Him. And instead of trying to rejoice in the fact of creation and in the study of that, which is important, the Bible's clear that God has given us certain things to exercise ourselves with. And brother, you, and there are, there are people that spend their entire lives studying the greatness of God's creation. Studying the greatness of uh, natural laws and all those kind of things that make the world what it is. Fascinating stuff. But instead of studying it and rejoicing in its truth as it magnifies God, man complicated it. Said it wasn't true and tried to find them. Surely it can't be that simple that God created. The Bible says in Colossians 1.15 that, that Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible, invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. Uh, true science is merely a discovery of the greatness of God. And then there's the questions of, you know, what are we doing here? Uh, what is the purpose of man's existence? God answers that question in Ecclesiastes 12 and 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. And then, of course... Where are we going? 
I mean, I th- you know, the Bible says that God has put eternity in our hearts. And uh, the, the phrase there is that uh, God has put the world in our hearts. That doesn't mean that he's made us worldly. Yeah. He doesn't need to be making any more of that. We're worldly enough anyway. Uh, we're but dust. Uh, but anyway, the idea is there God's put eternity in our heart. God has made us internal beings and it's not long before after having lived this life, we begin to ask ourselves, you know, what's the purpose of it all? And, uh, you know, no, is there some greater design? And of course, the answer to that is yes. And this idea in the heart of man of some future state has been put there by God. Jesus answers the question in Matthew 25, 46, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous unto life eternal. Two options. Two places, heaven or hell. Life or death. Bliss or judgment. It's all in the Bible. It's, it's, uh, it's simply put in the Bible. Jesus said, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. That's it. God tells us clearly, simply, where we came from, what our purpose is, and where we're going. And so then there is this question that bothers men when they begin to think about deity and they begin to think about the future life after death. The question of Job 25 and 4, uh, though not exactly worded, comes to the mind uh, of very many. How then can man be justified with God? How can I make God happy? If God created me and I'm here for his purpose, how can I make God happy? How can I be justified with him? Or how, Job said, can he be clean that is born of a woman? He's talking there about the sinfulness of man. How can I be clean and pure and right with God? Well, the Lord answers that question as well. Look back in your Bible with me at John chapter number 10. The gospel of John and chapter 10. And uh, verse number nine, Jesus said this, John 10 and nine. He said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. I'm the door. You come in to a relationship with God, he said, by me. And he says in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are you saved through faith. By grace through faith. Now, that seems awfully simple to most of us. But the fact of the matter is, this idea of salvation has been so utterly complicated that people literally fret themselves into an early grave where in how in the world they're going to be right with God. God says it, for by grace are you saved. Oh, but surely it can't be that easy. No, no, listen to what God simply said, for by grace. Are you saved? Through faith, that is faith in the fact that Jesus died for our sin, was buried, and rose again the third day. All these religions, you got to do something for God in order to make it. Listen, true faith is, is, uh, and, 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 uh, is simple and God laid it out. It's, it's not what we all, the... Uh, the uh, complicated machinery of things that some people say we must do for God. It's what God did for us in Jesus. (laughs) 
How can we have eternal life? Look in John chapter five, just back a few chapters. John chapter number five and uh, verse 24. <coughs> John chapter five and verse 24, the Lord said, verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice uh, of, the, uh, of the son of God and they that hear shall live. We get eternal life by hearing him, by receiving his word, by believing on him. And then he tells us over here one more, please, in Romans chapter number 10. Romans chapter 10. Look, uh, this is one of the uh, great blessings of Christianity is to share these simple truths with those who do not know God. Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. It's not something we can attain on our own. It's something we receive by faith in Christ. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Thank the Lord, it's simple. It's man that makes it complicated. And I agree with uh, uh, and appreciate what Brother Ron Comfort said about this complicated theology of Calvinism. That you cannot read the Bible alone and come out a Calvinist. Jesus died for all men, period. And he said, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, period. Amen. And yet we find this complicated thing. You know, by the way, somebody said, if you ever get to thinking about uh, following a, a, a theology that has some man's name on it, you might want to think again. And so God answers these matters of salvation quite simply. He answers the matters of the issues of life quite simply. And our, our life is helped when we realize not only that he has the unco uncomplicated answers to the questions of life, but he has uncomplicated answers to the problems of life. What does he tell us? Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. So the whole issue of, of beginning to unravel the complications of our life many times is just simply going back to trusting God. To believing what God has said. And he offers peace as a result. You would think, you know, some, some say it's billions and billions of years. We believe in a young earth. I don't know exactly how, I wasn't there when it was created, were you? But we believe in a young earth. It doesn't matter, that's still some several thousand years. And have you noticed that man's pretty smart? God gave us a brain, it's an amazing thing. Figured a lot of stuff out. And we sent people to the moon, back again. And all just the, you know, the, 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 the uh, uh, amazing principles of, uh, of medicine, advancements, it's amazing. But here's the thing, nobody is willing to stand up and say in their right mind and say, I got it all figured out. I got all of life figured out. Nobody. Why? Because obviously 
life and all the aspects of it are bigger than we are. But God is the one that created life. And I think it's all part of his design to teach us to trust him with life. And as we do, he offers us peace as we learn to trust him that he, you know, the Bible says in Psalms, uh, Psalm 37, 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. When we think about all that we do not know about life, it's a blessing to think that the God that does is guiding us. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighteth in his way. Trusting him, trusting him that he knows everything. The Bible says in Colossians chapter two, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him. Trusting him is the key. I wonder if there would be anybody here who would say, you know what, I see it. And there are many ways in which I have unnecessarily complicated my own life. And especially my own faith. It's good for us sometime to think back about maybe how things were back before when the church was just being founded in Jerusalem. How did things go for a church meeting then? How, how did those things go? And the majority of the churches most likely were rather small. They gathered in fear of their life and fear of persecution. And they, so therefore, they not only gathered in fear, but as a result, they gathered in focus on the Lord and His Word and His goodness and His grace and His wisdom and His strength. That was their focus, was Him. And over time, God has blessed his churches. And that's a good thing. Until it comes to the place where it gets unnecessarily, humanly complex and complicated. We have to guard against that. At all times of our life. But especially in times like Christmas time and Thanksgiving and all those kind of things to remember what it's really all about. Mankind has a terrible bent toward overly complicating the simplicity of Christ. And that's why Paul warned against it in 2 Corinthians 11. God, by the Spirit, led Paul to warn us. As an illustration of this, someone wrote the following with regard to simplicity. In 10 words, God gave the creation story. On the other hand, a government order to set the price of cabbage took 26,911 words. The Lord's Prayer or model prayer can be read in 56 words. And some of those words say, give us this day our daily bread. But here is how that would be written in legalese. We respectfully petition, request, and entreat that due and adequate provision be made this date and date first above inscribed for the satisfying of petitioner's nutritional requirements and for the organization of such methods of allocation and distribution as may be deemed necessary and proper to assure the reception by and for said petitioners of such quantity of cereal products herein, afterward called bread, as shall in the judgment of the afore and petitioners constitute sufficient account. (laughs) 
I prefer give us this day our daily bread. Listen, look at it again, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Lord, as we close in prayer this morning, we thank you for that simplicity.